and lying. And I was looking up some synonyms for uh, lies, and there's a whole list of words that depict lies in its various forms and in its various subtleties. Um, the first thing is that lies are deception. We are perpetrating our deception on the other person that we're lying to. Uh, and uh, so we're deceiving ourselves also because if we're lying, we're going against God's will, we're going contrary to God's will. We are deceiving ourselves and deceiving others. And I do believe, in, to a great extent, we're trying to deceive God. It's as if he doesn't hear or he doesn't see. We'll fabricate stories. Fabrication is you're making it up yourself. It's nothing to do with reality or truth. It's only to do with what you want to uh, pretend as reality, pretend as truth. You're fabricating stories, <coughs> falsifying information. You're giving the wrong information. You're telling people one thing when you know in your heart and soul it's not true. You know that it's wrong. And uh, you're covering it up by just falsifying the information. We're inventing. It's the same as fabricating. Inventing <coughs> stories. Inventing truths or half-truths. We're not at all concerned about what is truth. We're misrepresenting people. We're, we, we will even go so far as to perjure ourselves, under, to lie under oath. When you've called God as a witness and put your hand on the Bible to say, uh, I'm going to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And as God is my witness, this is what, what the truth is. And then you proceed to lie and to invent and fabricate <coughs> and to do all of these things. I don't know the world thinks nothing of it. Nothing. But for us as Christians, for us who have been transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, for us who say that truth is everything and that God is truth. For us who say we've given allegiance to the truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, for us to be fabricated and lying is just contrary to everything that we are and everything that we stand for. There were some words here that I wasn't too familiar with. I, I heard the words, but I didn't know how to define them. I didn't know what they meant. Prevaricate is to speak or act falsely or evasively with intent to deceive. We all know the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They wanted to look like they were generous, self-sacrificing Christians. And so when others were giving uh, to support the needy there, they sold a piece of land for a certain amount of money. They made a pact with each other <coughs> to say that they got, instead of X, they got B amount of money for it. It was different. They were, they were pretending that they were giving all that they got for the land. And of course, Ananias was challenged by Peter because the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he wasn't telling the truth. And he told them he wasn't lying to men, he was lying to God. He was lying to the Holy Spirit, lying to God. And that's a serious, serious matter indeed. So serious that Ananias was struck down dead. His wife came in a little bit later and she was the <coughs> other conspirator in this prevarication. They were speaking and acting falsely, with, evasively, with intent to deceive. That's what they were doing. How often have you done it? Have you done it recently? Equivocate is another word. To use vague or ambiguous language to avoid speaking directly or honestly. When Abraham 
Abraham was going down into Egypt, he said to Sarah, they're going to see that you're a beautiful woman. They're going to take you and they're going to kill me. I want you to say that you're my sister. <coughs> now there was, a, there was a truth in it. She was his half-sister, but she wasn't his sister. So they went down to Egypt and as Abraham <coughs> foretold, they did see her and take her. Pharaoh brought her into his palace and it was only because God intervened by sending plagues on the palace that uh, Sarah was saved from this predicament. The half-truths which are nothing, white lies, they're only white lies. So I didn't, so I didn't tell you I got X more amount more of that money. It was just a white lie. I didn't mean anything by it. it just, we just wanted to hold on to a few more for ourselves. Well, why didn't you just say that in the first place, Ananias? Why didn't you just tell them, I sold it for X amount, and here I'm giving you this amount of money. We're holding on to the rest because we need it for our own security or whatever else. That's the truth. It would have been as easy as that. Nobody expected him to give everything. Well, others obviously were giving everything, and for that reason, he felt he needed to give everything so that he would look the part when he was coming up with the proceeds. So, vague or ambiguous language, and that's to avoid speaking directly or honestly. So when you hear it coming out of your mouth, and you know that what you're saying is to avoid telling the truth or speaking honestly, you know now that you're equivocating. You're trying to cover up. You're making a story that seems to be right but isn't right. And to dissimulate is to conceal one's real feelings by pretense. I never knew that was a lie. I never knew that was a lie. But it is lying. We have to be able to say honestly how we feel. We might not be feeling spiritual or Christian. We might not be thinking the right thoughts. But God expects you to acknowledge that you're not thinking the right thoughts. That your feelings are not in keeping with what the Word of God wants. He expects you to be able to say that, acknowledge it to yourself, acknowledge it to others, acknowledge it to God. <coughs> this is a whole package, and the package involves us being honest, inside and outside, in every way trustworthy. And when we give our word, we mean to carry it out. We absolutely mean to carry it out and we will break our necks to try and carry it out because we've given our word. <clears throat> Years ago, even in business, people could shake hands and could trust the other person that they carry it out what they promised they would do. <clears throat> now you can't trust anyone. And even if you get an agreement, a written agreement, it doesn't mean that they're going to carry it out. It just means you might have some legal right to go and challenge what they said they do and didn't do. But that's about the size of it. Dishonesty is rife, absolutely rife in this country. It's rife in Africa, it's rife in America, it's rife in Europe, everywhere. What we could see with this banking crisis is how much people were lying and cheating and covering up. All these words were, there was deception, prevarication, dissimulation, equivocation, misrepresentation. It was all going on. And people think, well, that's the way business works. 
don't do it, you don't make money. You don't make money, you might as well not be a business partner. Well, if that's the sort of businessman you want to be, you go ahead. But I don't think God's going to accept it from you or from them. And that one day it will be challenged, and one day it will be exposed for what it really is. Let's look at James and how he describes the, the tongue. In James chapter 3. And he puts it in the context of brethren who want to become teachers, who want to be leaders, who want to be in the forefront, who want to be telling everybody else what to do and what not to do. He says in verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. <coughs> For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. One little match thrown into the tinder can set a whole forest on flame. A flame. The tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. It talks about every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea being tamed. But verse 8 says no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. I know there are brethren who speak really sanctified words in this place to other Christians, but who are fellow mounted with the business people they work with on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and even if they get a bit of overtime on Saturday, they'll do it on Saturday as well. They have no conscience about identifying with them, swearing and cursing and telling lies. It's all part of what life is all about. But you're leading a dual life. You're a hypocrite. What's coming out of your mouth is what is in your heart. That's the problem. There's the real problem. Up here. Let's look at Matthew chapter 15. says in verse 11, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. Pharisees were big on clean foods as the Old Testament required. They were happy as long as you were not eating unclean foods. That you are making sure that you observe the law on these matters. Jesus says everything that goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated. It's of no consequence. That's why he ruled that all foods are clean. You can eat what you want as long as you give thanks.
But he goes on to say in verse 17, Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with un unwashed hands does not defile the man. So, what's coming out of the mouth is what is in the, in the head. And if you need to clean up your tongue, it's not mouthwash that you need, it's the blood of Christ to cleanse your conscience from these dead works, these sinful works, so that you might live acceptably before him. Every Christian has the responsibility of controlling his or her tongue. James chapter 1 verse 26. He describes it in very colorful terms. He says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue. Now the bridling, of course, is a bridle for the horse. Keep the horse in check. Bridling your tongue is telling you you need to keep your <coughs> mouth and your tongue in check. You need to pull the reins when you feel free to express any filthy communication out of your mouth and in particular any lies that will come out of your mouth. Stop yourself before you do it. Don't allow it to happen and then try and uh, retrieve the situation. It's, it's not possible sometimes to retrieve the situation. There are some things that are irreparable and sometimes the damage that you do with your tongue is irreparable. You take a rose and you crush it. Beautiful rose and you crush it. There's no way of sorting it out again. That's irreversible. And so it is with some of the things that we say, and particularly the lies that we perpetrate. <coughs> We're to bridle our tongues. And if we don't, we deceive our own hearts. Because he says, this man's religion is worthless. You're claiming to be a great Christian. You're claiming to be guided by the Holy Spirit as the, the Word of God opens up to you and tells you what to do. It all becomes worthless because you will not allow yourself, or you will not, how would I say, discipline yourself to the extent that you get control of your tongue and listen to what you're saying and make sure that what you're saying is in keeping with God's word and make sure that you're thinking about it in the presence of God. Jeremiah 57 is helpful here. Verse 11. He says, Of whom were you worried and fearful when you lied and did not remember me, nor gave me a thought? God says through Jeremiah to his people. Was I not silent even for a long time? So you do not fear me, he says. God didn't break into their lives and check the sins that they were committing with their lips by bringing punishment directly upon them as he did with Ananias and Sapphira. So what happens is we do it and the sky doesn't fall down and uh, there's no recriminations, no Christian here that nobody's going to say that's a lie. You've got away with it. And of course, once you feel empowered by getting away with it, you're going to do it again, and again, and again. And the more you get away with it, the more you feel, eh, just tell a lie. <coughs> yes, who were you afraid of? <coughs> when Israel was in negotiations with all the nations around them, trying to work 
worked out treaties with them in order to protect themselves. They forgot about God. And they told any lie that they needed to tell in order to impress these people who they thought would give them the protection against others who railed against them. We do that. We want the approval of men. And we'll lie to get it. We'll even fabricate stories to impress them. And after we finish and they've swallowed it hook, line and sinker, we think, how superior I am to these agents who believe anything I tell them. We tell lawyers in order to prevent ourselves from getting into trouble. If I tell the truth, I'm in trouble. If I tell social welfare the truth, I'll be cut off. I can't tell them the truth. There's always a reason why you can't tell the truth. And it might justify it in your head, but in God's presence, a lie is a lie. And it's unacceptable to him who is the truth. And most of the time when we're lying, we've forgotten God. We don't take him into consideration. That's why I've said to you, when it's coming out of your mouth, you listen to what's being said and be judgmental of it just as God would listen and be judgmental of it. So that you might see that you're about to say or have said something that is wrong, correct it immediately. Say, I said that, but now on, on uh, reflection, I don't think I can do that. Because this is in the way and that's in the way. And honestly speaking, it wouldn't happen the way I just said it's going to happen. It can't. So let me be truthful with you. Let me tell you what really is the truth. So many of these people who are doing work for you in the house or whatever. There's <laughs> other people that you get in and they're doing things for you. They're making promises that they don't intend to keep at all. And it's very hard for them to accept when you say, look, if it's two weeks, that's fine. If it's three weeks, that's fine. If you're telling me the truth and it'll have to be four weeks, we'll accept that. Just tell me the truth so that I know where I stand with you. They won't do it. They just won't do it because they can't do it. They're so trained in lying right now. Well, this sort of situation, not you, it's certainly not you at all. Because there was some terrible situations uh, back in the Old Testament. Let's look at Isaiah 59. Verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Devastation and destruction are in their highway, highways. They do not know the way of peace, and there is no justice in their tracks. They have made their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not know peace, he says. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but we behold darkness. For brightness... But we walk in gloom, we grope along the wall like blind men, we grope like those who have no eyes, we stumble at midday in the twilight among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears, this is so descriptive, all of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions multiply before you, and our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us. And we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God. <coughs> speaking oppression and revolt. Conceiving in and offering from the heart lying wars. A whole, a whole society involved. And when I say the whole society, there are aware of the exceptions. There were the people of God who were spiritually minded. Who knew what truth was. Who did speak the truth. But they lived among those who were of unclean lips. And it's very hard for us not to be contaminated by it. 
Isaiah lived among the, these people. And their, their, the whole world was just a make-believe world. So as to enrich themselves, take advantage wherever they could, make a profit at any cost, even if it's my own soul, at any cost. <coughs> this is the way things have gone. And Jeremiah was trying to appeal to these people because they were the people of God, God's chosen nation. He wanted them to straighten up, to see where it was all going wrong. And you know, the more we had, the worse the moaning got. And the growling like bears. And the injustices. And the feeling of being lost. And that's because we've removed ourselves far from God. We've removed ourselves far from God. Look at Jeremiah chapter 9. It says in verse 3, They bend their tongue like their bow, lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil. They do not know me, declares the Lord. Everyone be on guard against his neighbor. Do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily. It's interesting. Um, when I was studying this, the word words deals craftily is actually um, a translation, uh, or an explanation rather than a translation. It says, every brother was a Jacob. Remember Jacob, the deceiver? Jacob, God's anointed, God's chosen. And yet in order to get the birthright, he didn't rely on God. He chose to make his father's stew, the one that uh, Esau would make for him. He covered his hands up with uh, lambs, um, skin so as it would feel hairy. He put on his clothes so that it would smell like he saw. Uh, Jacob was fooled, half fooled. He says the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he wasn't entirely convinced, but at the same time, there was the deception here. Speaking, it's a, a prevarication, falsely or evasively, with intent to deceive. <coughs> They're not only speaking, but acting so as to deceive, to get one's own way. So we could be protecting ourselves. We could be trying to impress others. But at the same time, we're getting our own way. We're getting our own way. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 26. He says, and um, 17 is great, it's another subject, but, it, uh, but it's, it's good advice. Let one who takes a dog by the ears, or like one who takes a dog by the ears, is he who passes by and meddles with strife not belonging to him. Two people fighting on the street, having an argument, probably family members. Somebody... Somebody's going to come up and say, will you leave that woman alone and don't be talking to her like that. You can't be doing that on the street and so forth. You don't know what the argument's about. They pick one side or the other in order to so-called defend them, protect them. They haven't got a clue what they're getting into. You take my dog by the ears and I'll tell you, you'll get a bite. Especially if you're hurting me. So the warning is there. If it's none of your business, it's none of your business. Leave it alone. Don't get yourself involved. You're only going to get hurt. And maybe you're only going to hurt others. Look at verse 18. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, 
was I not joking? There's only a joke. It wasn't, it wasn't really the truth. It's just a joke. There's no joke. And there's too many truths or things said as a joke which are hurtful and stinging. And it's a great thing here in Ireland. Joking about each other and, uh, and making remarks about each other <coughs> just to create the laugh. But the remarks are like arrows and firebrands. They're dangerous, they hurt, they can maim and sometimes kill. <coughs> we need to stop that messing. We need to control our tongues. We need to have respect for each other and not be putting each other down, even in jest. We need to get ourselves together and put the bridle in our mouths so that we won't sin against the Lord. In verse 27, he, he says, um, let us read 26, Though his hatred covers itself with guile, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone it will come back on him. A lying tongue hates those it crushes, and a flattering mouth works ruin, he says. So you can see what God thinks of lying. And lying through flattery as well, even. Flattering another person for the sake of gaining an advantage is dishonest. Be careful with the flattery. And those who receive it, don't enjoy it as much as you do. Think, no, don't think so highly of yourself as to think, these people see me as true worth. Thank God somebody sees me for what I am. Humble yourself before God and before others. Because you're not all that you cracked up to be, even in your own head. In God's sight, you are as nothing. And that's the more the reality than the vision that we have of ourselves in our heads. I want you to see that the God we deal with is a God of truth. In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 29, <clears throat> Samuel says to the people, Also the glory of Israel, who is God, will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. God will not lie. That is stated more than once in the scriptures. If we go to Hebrews chapter 6 and in verse 18, we see that there were promises made to Abraham and to us. And in these promises, God was telling the truth. He says in verse 18, 17 and 18. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the ears of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have a strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. God is a God of truth. Psalm 31 verse 5. He talks about, into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hand I, commend, I commit my spirit, he says, you have ransomed me. O Lord God of truth. O Lord God of truth. God's word is truth. God is truth. God's word is truth. God's kingdom is a kingdom of truth. Listen to that. God's word is truth. God is truth. God's kingdom is a kingdom of truth. Lies have no part in it. No part in it whatsoever. No lie is of the truth. 
1 John 2, 21. No lies of the truth. You cannot be lying and telling the truth. Truth excludes lies just as light excludes darkness. When we want to lie, we are going against our God. We're going against the law of the kingdom of God. We're going against the word of God. We are committing a very serious sin. And the hardest part as a preacher is to get it across how serious this whole business is. We're so casual about it all. We justify so much of the lies and the cheating and the deceptions. I can't believe that we would think so little of lying. But too many people do, unfortunately. You know where the lies come from, though, don't you? Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. And he'll tell us. <coughs> he says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So here you are saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a son of God or a daughter of God. But if you are, act like God, speak like God, speak the truth. Don't come along and think you can lie and glorify God with your lie. The lie is of the devil. The devil's out to destroy God and everything that God is and has. You're siding with the devil every time you lie. You're making it known that your father is the devil. When you're believing a lie. <clears throat> it's so important for us to see that. We're commanded in Ephesians chapter 4 to speak the truth with one another. Verse 25, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Speak truth with our neighbor, for we are members of one another. <coughs> you take that seriously, does that make an impact on your soul? Will you allow that to sink into your heart and say, that's the standard by which I must live. That is the command which I must keep. That is the way of God which I will love and cherish and walk in, even if it's to my hurt. Colossians 3. Verse 9, after telling us to lay aside anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech from our mouths, he says in verse 9, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. The lying has to do with our old selves. The way we used to be, the way we used to live before we became Christians, new creatures in Christ Jesus, committed to God's cause, to what is right, to what is true. Don't lie to one another. And that's not just among the Christians. Don't lie to anyone. 
You've been created in the image of God, and now you're trying to commingle that image of God with lying and the devil and everything that's dark and wrong. You can't have it both ways. You're either standing for the truth or you're standing for the liar and the lies. You can't have it both ways. Are you for God? Are you for the truth? Will you speak the truth to each other as God has commanded you? Pride is very much involved in life. Very much involved. We want to save face. We want to look good. We want to be considered intelligent. We want the approval of men. <clears throat> but there are two Old Testament prophecies about the kingdom when it was to come, which we are in right now, <coughs> which I think are very helpful. Uh, Zephaniah near the uh, back of the Old Testament. Chapter 3. Beginning with verse 11. In that day you will feel no shame because of your deeds which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly or meek people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they shall feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. We've got nothing to fear when we tell the truth. It might look like you've got everything to lose by telling the truth, but you have everything to lose by not telling the truth. You've got to entrust your soul to a faithful creator when you're telling the truth, because that's the only protection you've got. And you can say to the Lord, look, I'm going to look like a fool telling the truth here, Lord. I know it. But I'm humble enough, hopefully, to trust you and to accept that you will protect me and work out what is necessary while I am continuing to tell the truth which you want me to tell or to speak. Jerusalem, which is the new Jerusalem, was to be called a city of truth. It's like saying the kingdom of heaven was to be called a kingdom of truth. It's that association with the truth that we have that makes us different. And it will be audibly different when people hear you speak the truth. It'll become visually different because they will see you living the truth in your life. The truth is what's all important, not what people think, not what people say, not how they approve of you or disapprove of you, not what they believe or don't believe. The truth is all important because the truth will set us free. People have all sorts of problems in their lives and they're wondering, how can I get out of these difficulties? How can I be free of my past? Speak the truth. Look for the truth. Accept the truth. Walk by the truth. Live by that truth. That's the way out of any difficulty that you might have. Whether it's in the past or the present, or if you conceive it to be in the future, do what the Lord wants you to do in these matters. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14. It talks about the 144,000 who were in heaven, representative of those <coughs> who had died at that time and had gone to be with the Lord. He says, These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste, he says. 
the, the physical immorality and idolatry were so linked together <coughs> that one could become uh, a statement of the other. Uh, you, you talk about the word <coughs> home first. It doesn't mean they weren't married or that they didn't have relationships. It just means that they weren't into immorality. That's what it means. And chances are, if they weren't into immorality, they weren't into idolatry either. That was the spiritual adultery. But these were both physically and spiritually chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Watch this, verse 5. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Hold on. They are the ones who will be with the Lord. I tell you, I want to be with the Lord. And I want to tell the truth. And I want to bridle my tongue and make every effort to be pleasing to the Lord in these matters. If I've fallen short of that, I want to ask God for forgiveness. <coughs> And I want to ask him for the strength to help me to be able to speak the truth in every circumstance and at all 